this panel discussion. We have uh, Sam Bierman, one of the co-founders and executive director of Mark. Um, also, Zach Snitzer on the line with us as well. From the dorm team, we have Dr. Amanda Falk, my partner and our chief of clinical at the dorm, as well as Sarah Hart, our uh, DC director. Um, Tracy Ashworth, our director of marketing, welcomed you all. And we have Meredith Williams behind the scenes. She's going to be manor, manor, uh, monitoring the uh, the technology behind all of this. Um, just quickly for some housekeeping, we're going to be muting all of you during the presentation period. Um, please go ahead and use the chat box. It looks like we have over 100 people on this today. Um, so let's please uh, keep the questions coming in. We're going to be monitoring those during the presentation. We'll certainly get to as many as we can. We'll be following up on uh, this presentation with a note just to provide um, the PowerPoint presentation to you all and contact information for, for all members from the leadership team on this call today to, to certainly continue the conversation if you have any further questions. Uh, with that, we're going to queue up the PowerPoint and turn it over to Amanda Falk to get started. Hi, guys. Thanks so much for being here. It's such a, a good, lovely, big crowd on Zoom. Uh, so today, like John said, we are going to be talking about substance use treatment during COVID-19. It feels like I, it, it, in one way, it feels like it just was yesterday when life was normal. And in other ways, it feels like life has not been normal for years. Um, but the reality is, is that in the middle of March, uh, life as we knew it and treatment facilities changed. and leading up to that change uh you know we at the dorm began to really start thinking about when we need to go virtual um when treatment needs to change who is going to be uh the most vulnerable and and how do we address those vulnerabilities and one population that really we really identified as needing to take a very close look at was our substance using, substance abusing clients. What we know is that right now we are certainly living in a very uncertain, very stressful time and that people in general are struggling, but those who use substances as a way to cope are, are struggling in very unique ways. We have seen mass disruptions to supportive networks like familiar 12-step meetings and support groups, um, conventional inpatient and outpatient treatment programming is also looking very different. Access to support can be unpredictable and, and availability can also be limited. Some treatment facilities have been unable to accept new clients or have had to discharge clients prematurely, accessing the right level of care, accessing the right fit in terms of care can be difficult. And these are all things that can create somewhat of a perfect storm for substance using clients. Next slide, please, Meredith. Um, you know, when this all started, we began to actually see substance use increasing in the general population. Uh, alcohol beverage sales increased in March as compared to the same week or the same month the year before. We are seeing all over social media things being posted about quarantine o'clock and Zoom happy hours. Um, alcohol consumption being almost celebrated as a universal coping mechanism. Many states stating that liquor stores are considered to be essential. One thing that we found happening here um, in New York City, and I'd be interested to see, um, to hear more, um, Sam in, in, in DC, is for some of our clients who struggle with problematic behaviors around food, we've had to get their meals delivered to their apartment. So we're ordering meals from local restaurants on their behalf and getting them delivered. And we had a client who reported that 
in their food delivery was some complimentary alcohol because apparently many restaurants are including alcohol in their orders as like a free perk to entice customers to continue to utilize them for business because business is so slow. So we've had to make a special note and all food deliveries do not include any alcohol. Uh, a lot of our clients are also reporting that their drug dealers are reaching out at warp speeds, um, trying to entice them to purchase um, substances with, you know, in a contactless or COVID safe um, delivery options. Uh, and, and obviously getting these types of text messages or alcohol delivered to your apartment when you're already vulnerable, anxious, and stressed is, is highly triggering. What we know is that, you know, using substances isn't going to place you more at risk for contracting COVID-19 unless when you are high or under the influence, you're behaving in ways that are putting you in social situations or settings that place you at risk. But what we do know is that using alcohol and drugs does suppress your immune system and that it makes you more susceptible to things like pneumonia and can lead to various issues with heart and lungs so that if you do acquire the illness, you are certainly in that vulnerable risk group. So any consumption of alcohol or drugs is, is certainly not something that is being recommended right now. Next slide, please. In terms of um, some more social triggers that we are seeing happening right now, there's two factors that are making substance using clients um, particularly vulnerable. One is social isolation, and two is unstructured time. Both of these things are big sort of red flags in early recovery. And now there are things that people don't have so much control over. Due to uh, COVID-19, we've been asked to shelter in place, to socially distance ourselves. And one of the most common symptoms and triggers for substance use is isolation and loneliness. So we're seeing clients who are in situations where they're either sheltered in place alone or you know maybe with a few family members and they're not able to socialize and to find that um, support and get out of that loneliness that they need to get out of in early recovery the simple things like you know setting up chairs before a meeting or doing the meeting after a meeting and going to a diner with friends these are things that fill time and that make you feel less lonely so that is something that we wanted to keep into our in our minds as we were addressing the way that we were going to plan treatment for our clients during this time uh, we all know that keeping busy is important and we know that having he healthy physical routines is important and we know that boredom is something that's important to stay away from in early recovery and I've got to say that um, being stuck inside all day is, is pretty boring. Anxiety, depression, and fear. These are sort of the trilogy of things that we hear a lot of our clients, especially in early recovery from substance use, talk about. We are in a complete state of unknown and uncertainty right now. And this makes anxiety and fear at an all-time high. Anxiety and fear are things that alcoholics and addicts tend to be very motivated to want to numb and self-medicate because they don't feel good. They feel actually deeply uncomfortable and at times intolerable. And having these feelings can lead to cycles of depression and anger and hopelessness and just feeling utterly powerless over, over life. We hear, you know, a couple of acronyms in, in recovery rooms and in treatment facilities around fear and how fear can stand for something positive, like face everything and recover, 
or it can stand for something like forget everything and run. There's also another language version of that that I won't use right now. Um, we, we certainly want our, our clients to face everything and recover, and that's the goal of treatment. Unfortunately, in the COVID-19 world, with all the heightened unknowns and uncertainty and anxiety, um, the, the fear for us is that it can be very easy for addicts to say, forget this, I'm not gonna face recovery right now, I'll address this when COVID-19 is over. The problem is, is that none of us really know when this is going to be over. For some of our clients, because we work primarily with young adults, um, instead of sheltering in place alone, they've decided to shelter in place with family. And in many cases, sheltering in place with family is even more triggering than sheltering in place alone. We're seeing one of two things happen. Either the clients are highly triggered by family members who are either unaffir unaffirming or invalidating or maybe have substance using problems of their own. And this creates day-to-day -day sort of battles and arguments and triggers. Or on the other hand, we're seeing family members report to us that they are highly triggered because they have not had a day-to-day, -day, up close, real-time look at their child's true struggles with addiction until this time because now they're seeing it every day since they're alone in a house sheltering in place with their, with their child who is a substance using individual. So given this landscape and given, you know, all of these vulnerabilities, I think it was really important for us as treatment providers to look at treatment and how we needed to adjust treatment to address these vulnerabilities. And, and this was a pretty um, big task because not only did we have to address these increased vulnerabilities, we had to address them in a changing treatment landscape. We were no longer able, it was no longer safe for us to provide conventional outpatient treatment in a face-to-face -face modality. We had to switch to a virtual platform. So what we did in essence was, first of all, two weeks prior to going fully virtual, we did a lot of practicing with our clients. We did a ton of practice virtual groups, practice virtual individual sessions, practice virtual health and wellness activities. We really wanted them to be comfortable with this platform before we had to go live and we wanted to get their feedback. What worked, what didn't work, what did we need to tweak? And by the time we went fully virtual, we were all fairly confident that this was something that both clients and staff were able to navigate and were comfortable navigating and we had ironed out most of the major kinks. In terms of treatment itself, we wanted to look at um, how we could sort of bookend our clients' days, recognizing that there was going to be less accountability because they weren't going to be coming in here and getting you know, eyes on them per se. So what we did was in addition to all of their regularly scheduled individual sessions, group sessions, which were now happening virtually, every single client, regardless of the intensity level of treatment they were receiving, gets a beginning of day and an end of day check-in with their coach. And their coach is a licensed clinician. So at the beginning of the day, it was helping them be accountable to get up at a certain time, to set intentions and goals for the day. And then at the end of the day, it was sort of a day end review. What worked today? What could maybe work a little bit better tomorrow? And what steps are you gonna take before you go to sleep to practice good sleep hygiene? We did not want our clients falling into old routines of you know, staying up until all hours and then sleeping in. So those beginning and end of day check-ins have been integral to helping them stay on a schedule. We got them very connected with virtual 12-step meetings and other online uh, self-help support groups. Um, Zoom has been certainly great for a lot of those meetings. Some of our clients need us to Zoom with them as they Zoom onto the meetings because 
what we found is that um, some of the meetings that worked for them in person now felt a little bit overwhelming via Zoom just because of the sheer numbers and we've had to sort of adapt to find meetings for some of our clients that had less people attending um, and just less faces on the screen felt less overwhelming. So we've, you know, sort of had a very organic way of altering 12-step programming and 12-step attendance so as to meet their specific needs. Uh, the third thing that we wanted to do is, is just maintain the consistency. Their pre-COVID-19 routine was going to be the same in this COVID-19 world. So if on Monday they had four groups and two individual sessions in a yoga class, then that was still going to be the case every Monday during a shelter in place. That helps them to, um, to feel like they're a little bit more in control of their world because their schedule has maintained that consistency. We increased our self-care and wellness programming. We recognize that sitting in front of a computer screen and being on Zoom sessions hour after hour is utterly exhausting, physically, mentally, emotionally, and otherwise. So we've added in at least three health and wellness uh, opportunities throughout the day for our clients and they're lodged in between groups so that they can always have time to move, to breathe, um, to take a step away from talking. Uh, in addition, we are now making our groups instead of one hour, they're 50 minutes. So there's 10 minute breaks in between groups to take a walk, do some yoga, do some breathing. We have also increased our social groups. Um, this is big. I think that uh, one of the biggest fears of our clients was you know, we don't have our, our place to go to. We don't have our clubhouse downstairs where we can play pool and we can hang out and play board games. So A, we launched a virtual clubhouse so they can still do that virtually, but we've increased the number of social activities we offer on a, on a week to be, week basis so that every night of the week, there's some type of social activity offering, whether that's a board game night or a talent show or a pet show and tell we did recently. Every night of the week, there is something, and on weekends, there are at least three social opportunities a day for them to participate in them virtually. We've been able to do some virtual volunteering as a group uh, through a local organization, which has been wonderful for our clients. Doing service helps them to get outside of themselves and feel like they are making a difference and contributing. We have also, um, launched a campaign in which for every virtual session a client or family member attends we donate one dollar on their behalf last month it was to no kid hungry next month we will be launching a different campaign to donate money to and our clients have really embraced this knowing that Anytime they show up to something on their schedule, that's one more dollar that's being donated to um, a greater good. In the next slide, um, I'm gonna, we're gonna talk about sort of just what a sample schedule looks like so that you guys can have a sense of, for somebody who's here more intensively, their day is pretty packed with um, both individual work, group work, and then health and wellness and social stuff. So as you can see from the first clinical check-in to then doing a community breakfast with peers virtually, they might go to DBT group, then spend some time socializing in the clubhouse, mindfulness, eating lunch together. We're doing all of our meals together virtually, yoga, a step in spirituality group, then dinner, relapse prevention, 12-step meeting, and then the before bed check-in. So for our more sort of acute clients, they, they really have a very book-ended day and they're able to stay accountable to themselves, to their peers, and, and to their therapists. And now I'm going to turn things over to Sam to talk about um, what Maryland Addiction Recovery Center is doing. Thanks so much, Amanda. Hi, everybody. My name is Sam Bierman. I'm the Executive Director of MARC. 
Uh, obviously, this has been a trying time for everybody. So um, thankful for the dorm to ask me to participate in this with them. So I could talk to you guys a little bit about how Mark has adapted uh, during this time. And philosophically, you know, what, what we were trying to do and every protective measure that we've taken in, in everything that we've done since COVID has come out, uh, our focus has been on keeping the integrity of our program as much as possible while mitigating risk as much as possible. And so what we came up with was what you're seeing on your screen now. Um, almost immediately, we transferred all administrative and marketing and business development staff to working remotely. Um, that was, you know, obviously anybody that doesn't have direct patient contact can easily do their jobs from home. Um, we switched um, from what I know pretty much before anybody, before, before even Hogan, you know, shut the state down in Maryland, we switched all of our outpatient clients to telehealth. Um, in keeping the integrity of the program, there are two things that clients still have to come in for face to face, and that is their initial evaluation, and that is for a random drug test once a week. And we figured that, you know, with those two things, we could get a better sense of where our patients are at, keep some controls in place so that we're not just relying 100% on self report on how they're doing. Um, as well as mitigating the risk as much as possible. So when an outpatient client comes to Mark for a drug test, they are going in one door, they are seeing the same staff member every single week. That staff member is obviously you know, putting on uh, PPE in terms of a mask and gloves and um, taking a drug test and then leaving right after. In addition, right when COVID broke out for all of our outpatient clients or for a lot of them, we spoke to Soberlink to get as many Soberlinks as we possibly could. If you guys don't know what Soberlink is, it's a wonderful tool. It is a, um, um, what's it called? It's a mobile breathalyzer. Uh, so we give a Soberlink to a patient. We create a schedule of when they have to br breathe into the Soberlink and take a breathalyzer and the results come right back to our computer. And so that is a really good tool to hold patients in check um, during this time where you're not going to be seeing them or drug testing them frequently or laying eyes on them. Um, from very early on, we take every staff member, every patient's temperature daily. Um, we now have implemented for about the past three weeks that every staff member and every patient is wearing a mask at all times. Uh, the only times that you are not wearing a mask is if you're eating or if you're in your office alone. Um, we set up from early on alumni Zoom support meetings that happen weekly. So we have a different alumni that we put on Zoom that uh, speaks to all of our patients and does like a 12 step meeting every week. Our family support group, which, meet, which used to meet every Wednesday night at the Mark offices, switched to uh, a virtual meeting as well. Um, obviously from very early on, we suspended all family visits and sober support visits and that's gonna go on indefinitely until we feel it's safe again. And then, like I said, our philosophy with this is just to take as many measures as possible to mitigate the risk uh, without compromising the integrity of our program. And what I mean by that is that we have different levels of care, which come with patients that have different levels of acuity that have different needs. And so we need to during this time, individualize our program as much as possible that the high acuity patients are getting more face time. And, and stuff like that, when the lower acuity patients, we can almost switch to all virtual. Um, and so obviously that's been a huge balance for us. In addition, and I, I, I told a lot of people this the other day, um, you know, our biggest struggle probably more than anything um, is managing the families of our patients' anxiety around this, right? We got flooded with calls when COVID first came out and started to spread throughout the country. What are you guys doing? What protective measures are you taking? Should I come pick up my loved one now? Blah, 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 blah. And so our staff spend hours and hours coaching our families, redirecting them, explaining to them that we are taking measures, explaining to them that your loved one going from the milieu that we have here back into your home is probably more dangerous than them staying in our milieu here uh, where they are completely sheltered. Um, so that's been really tough. 
new areas of focus and new questions. Um, our marketing department has done an absolutely wonderful job of staying connected and keeping up meetings to let people know that our services are available during this time. And obviously they've had to make a lot of changes to their marketing strategies of how they are gonna get as many touch points as possible over a virtual platform. Um, and in missions, how do we ensure proper screening and quarantining measures for new admissions? This has been a big one. Um, I've heard throughout the past couple of weeks and months uh, there are certain treatment centers that have completely banned admissions from New York, New Jersey, California, from the hotspots that are going around in our country. I've heard of certain treatment centers not taking new admissions at all. I heard of one treatment center in Pennsylvania closing its doors indefinitely. Um, so everybody has kind of handled this a little bit differently. Uh, what we did is we set up multiple screening tools. Um, so the first time a patient calls up or a treatment center calls up with that patient, we are doing a full COVID screening with that patient. Then before they admit at 9 or 10 a.m. that morning, before they even get to our facility, we're doing a second COVID screening with them. And then we're doing a third when they actually get to our facility. And if anything is variable in that time or anything like that, then we are second questioning if we're, you know, if it's appropriate to take that admission or not. Um, but we have been really good about doing those screenings diligently and and thankfully we've been able to stay open and take admissions throughout this whole time and then looking to the future um, you know one of the things that surprised me about all this is the level of engagement that we're getting from our patients that have switched to a virtual platform so we have like a 95 percent engagement level throughout the entire covid from our patients on a virtual platform and quite frankly that was a huge surprise to me i was thinking that the second we switched to virtual like 40 percent of our outpatient clients would drop off within a matter of a week or two and that just wasn't the case what we found is and what our experience is is that patients one, doing intensive outpatient groups and individual sessions from home is much more convenient to them. So they're much more apt to do it. Two, they're in their most comfortable setting, which is their home. And so they feel very comfortable and vulnerable being in their home and being able to do that level of therapy from the home. This is the feedback we're getting from them. Um, and three, the fact that it's novel and new, not, not the virus, but the, the virtual platform, that it's novel and new really got them kind of passionate. Like that change of environment really kind of sparked um, a, a, a higher level of engagement with them that was really um, a surprise to us. Now, as the weeks have gone on, that kind of new platform excitement has kind of faded a little bit and we see them kind of rolling their eyes a little bit more, getting a little more agitated, getting a little bit more frustrated about the whole situation. Um, and so it's getting a little bit more dif more difficult to, to keep them engaged as times go, go on. Um, but we've been extremely you know, surprised at the engagement level and how our patients have responded to this. They've done extremely well when you know, I definitely was uh, skeptical and had second thoughts about that. Uh, we thankfully have not, knock on wood, had a positive case for any staff member or any patient here. Um, and, and so, you know, I, quite frankly, I just feel like we've been lucky in that respect. Um, and so we haven't had to quarantine anybody, but we have an emergency plan if we do have to quarantine somebody and what that would look like. Um, you know, as well, um, you know, next we are going to share some tips with you and what we've learned and experienced. So I think I'm going to turn it over to Sarah to share those tips with you guys. Thanks, Sam. I agree with all the things you said. I've been really pleased with um, how clients have been able to get along with this this virtual treatment, and and it's been fun to see. And it changes as as all things do. So we'll keep our eye on that. So here are some tips that we wanted to share with you all about um, how to kind of manage these issues as they come up, either with your clients or family members or friends or or in your community. So. We encourage people to connect in, in new ways. And, and we keep saying that, that social distance really doesn't have to mean social isolation. Uh, we are encouraging people to get creative with how they're connecting with each other. And just like what you were saying, Sam, about how impressed we've been with 
with people showing up on uh, for their outpatient sessions on Zoom. I think there are lots of opportunities that people have been able to find to engage with like-minded people, whether that be you know, on Zoom or on other platforms um, and really curating a community for themselves uh, in taking into consideration the, the physical distancing, but maintaining that social connection. We really think about the differences between some of those, those connecting platforms, you know, texting is so comfortable and can be can serve a role to stay connected, but it's definitely not as intimate as being able to see somebody's face. And so we really encourage people to think about, can you do a, a FaceTime or a Zoom versus sending a text or another kind of message online? And of course, like Amanda was saying at the beginning of this conversation, we're really encouraging people to attend online 12-step meetings. There are tons out there. This is also kind of a cool opportunity to check in with other communities of 12-step. So maybe you're used to your meetings that you go to locally, but maybe pop into something in Europe, or we had a, a, a visitor in a meeting a couple weeks ago from Japan. So it's been kind of neat to be able to expand uh, people's horizons around uh, the global 12-step community in this moment. While we're connecting socially and professionally on Zoom and in uh, and encouraging people to stay connected. We also want to be thoughtful about um, how to manage our media consumption and, and ways to set up a routine so that we don't just spend all of our time whittling away time on social media and, and not mindfully using our day. So we really encourage people to um, build a routine. We know that having a, a daily routine really combats urges and cravings. And this is an opportunity to do something new. We're gonna to have to change things up. So is there something that you've been interested in that you have been trying to find time to do and now maybe have that time? I think Amanda talked about this, about service and the Connect to Give Back campaign, but also a virtual volunteering that we know getting outside of yourself by doing some service and staying connected to a larger community does wonders. It helps the community, but it also helps us. And social media is such a mixed blessing at this time. So there's lots of ways to connect, spend time with each other, find like-minded people, but it's also really tempting to compare other people's outsides to our insides. And so we really want to make sure that we are um, mindfully using social media, dis disengaging when necessary, and maybe creating times of the day when maybe you check in, but maybe that's five minutes, 10 minutes, and then keep it moving and find something else to engage in. Super important to practice self-compassion and self-care. So especially in recovery, understanding that if there is a slip or a relapse, return to old behaviors, that this is not the end of the world, that it's about acknowledging it and moving forward, learning how to forgive yourself through the experience, and of course, using your community to help get back on track and, and process the feelings around that. We, we know that self-care, acts of, of kindness to your, towards yourself, um, whether that be positive affirmations or just treating your body kindly uh, is a really important practice, whether we're virtual or not uh, in recovery. And finally, we really encourage people to really focus on the fundamentals. We all have a lot that's out of our control right now. So trying to think about what is in our control, trying to think about continuing to find some ways to move our bodies each day, Amanda was talking about that Zoom fatigue, and I know for myself, by the end of every day, my shoulders and neck are tight, and so to be able to take breaks in between sessions and move around, um, finding ways to move a muscle, change a thought, if, if people are staying in a space and maybe stewing on some anxiety, depression, loneliness, to just get out of that space, have a physical change, whether it's take a walk while wearing a mask and doing all of the social distancing we need to do, but doing some online yoga in the safety of your own home, whatever that might be. Sleeping and eating is a really important part of all of our self-care routines and super important when it comes to recovery. E eating on a consistent and regular basis, eating feed food that fuels you, um, prevents being hangry, getting too hungry, finding yourself getting 
kind of stirred up because your body's giving you cues to eat and, and that can sometimes feel like a craving or a trigger, make people irritable. And we know sleep is, is the key to a lot of success. So trying to curate uh, or create an environment with good sleep hygiene to be able to stay on a cycle that's healthy, that doesn't mean every night is a perfect night's sleep, but it does mean we're at least doing everything that's within our control to be busy and active during the day, engaged, and then maybe we'll find ourselves tired at the end of the day and, and can set up some, some, some systems for success for falling asleep and sleeping as well as we can. Of course, this, this is all easier said than done. There's some challenges around this and we wanna be available for our clients and, and encourage people to contact their, their therapists, their mental health providers, their sponsors, other folks in their community for support. Sometimes it's just a matter of talking it through with somebody and, and thinking about some small adjustments that can really make a big difference in your overall well-being. So on that note, uh, I just want to say thank you so much for attending. That's the end of our formal presentation. So it's uh, we have an opportunity now, I'm just looking at the clock, we have a 10 or, 10 or 15 minutes to